And for those of you who don't know me, my name is Steve Fowler. I'm president of Fowler Associates Architects. Uh, 1421 Court Street, Suite D. I have to give a plug, of course. And uh, for those of you who don't know it, I redesigned this building as well. So it, uh, I've got a lot of buried uh, landmarks around the, around the Clearwater area. Yeah, Pier 60, yeah, 60, yeah, but I um, um, didn't think I was that old, but now that you remember, reminded me. We're going to talk about the Capitol Theater. Um, the original theater was built in 1921, um, and it was basically a open pavilion or a landscape area between uh, this building, which was the original Clearwater Sun newspaper building, and this little building right here, which was uh, K.K. Smith uh, and Sons uh, shop, and the first um, Clearwater Bank building was right here. And am I, I got my orientation up? Yeah, that's right. Um, and so this area right here was basically an amphitheater um, where they had performing uh, plays and Stuff like that. The original theater, this is the fly loft of the original and the canopy, um, was originally a vaudeville house and then went uh, dark in about 1930 and became a movie house. Uh, the original had 921 seats, no bathrooms, and so if you didn't go, you didn't go. <laughs> Next slide, please. Here is the, uh, what we call the Loki building. Pat Loki in the dress shop uh, moved from the beach over to here back in the 80s, I believe. Here is the theater itself. And this is the uh, little K.K. Smith jewelry store that uh, we're going to be talking about in a minute. But as you can see, uh, this was the 1950s uh, kind of redo of the existing structure. Next, please. This is the back of the Loki building, and this is the original fly. This is where all the uh, scenery flies were, were held. This little alley right, right here played a big part in enabling the project to happen. Go ahead. Next. Here's another picture of the, of the fly. If you are in the theater and you go backstage to the uh, dressing rooms, you will see that this exposed brick is part of the decor in that area. It's something uh, I'm real proud of to be able to, to keep some of the old uh, throughout the claim. Here's the marquee, and uh, like I said, here is the K.K. Smith. That building is 15 feet wide in front and 12 feet wide in the back. So uh, I believe that when that was constructed, they probably said, ah, you don't need no stinking permit, do it. So that's what we ended up with. Nothing is perpendicular, parallel, or, or uh, anything close to being nice. Go ahead. This is the top of the existing, and what they did was have these two grand gutters that would take all the rain that came off the top of the, of the roof, down these gutters, and Architecture 101 is never allow the water to come, never bring the water into a building on purpose, because it's going to have the noise from the water rushing down through those plastic pipes inside would destroy any kind of performance. So. Um, that was one of the big problems when Ruth Edgar Hall took over the management of this property to get um, performers to actually uh, give performances at, the, at this building. So it was such a bad thing. Next week. That's what the inside looked like when we first started. A lot of you probably remember that. I dated Emily Fowler and watched the guns of the Navarone right up there with her in 1961. Thanks. This is the stage. The Royal Theater came and added this portion of the stage uh, for performances because 
that alleyway, they didn't have any, any room to expand the stage. Uh, we were able to keep most of the original motif that you'll be able to see in a little while when we get there. Uh, the banks of, of speakers uh, got relocated. We, when we redid the stage, we put the base woofers uh, underneath the stage itself, which uh, freed up a lot of, a lot of the area for the, uh, for the stage itself. This is the original picture of the original electrical panels that probably need to be in the Smithsonian, but uh, it, it was abandoned, as you can see, the, back when the World Theater took it over. But they left it there, so that's, that's what it was. This is the upstairs of the back. Um, and you can, this is probably as close to what they had for a green room back there for the performers to be able to uh, relax before and or after their performance. Uh, as you can see, we're starting to get excited about the, re the redevelopment of the, of the whole project. Next, please. Question on that one. Oh. Sorry? What did you call it? A green room? Green room. It's where back in the day, or if you ever watched the old Johnny Carson reruns, they'll say the green room. And it is a room that is normally painted because green is very soothing. Oh, okay. And so uh, that's where the performers would go and relax prior to being on stage. This is the alleyway that from here to there is the alley that was abandoned, uh, fortunately, by the city and by the county. The county, though, said, well, in order for us to give up our half of the alley for you, the city of Clearwater, you have to rebuild our parking lot and not lose any parking spaces. Next slide. So this is the alley. This is us under construction right now. Um, as you can see, this is what we needed to, in order for the project to really work, we needed this alley. Next slide. Demolition started. This is the demolition of the, uh, we had tried it at one time to um, salvage the original Clearwater uh, Sun building, but because of the program to put a balcony, a rooftop terrace, there was no way that we could bring this structure up to current codes um, because it was literally a brick building. Uh, so we had to tear this, this portion of it down. Next. And this was the first coronary that the structural engineers had. The last 10 feet of that building that was taken down had zero foundation on it. It was just these bricks stacked on some lime rock. And like I said, that was, that was their first coronary. Uh, we were able to stop everything and to put in some pile foundations and some auger piles and a lot of technical things that uh, made it work. Next please. Uh, this you can see there was no foundation underneath that corner of the building. So this is what we were doing to put it back. Next. This is the little PK, KK Smith Sons, PK Smith Sons. And um, as you can see, they had over-excavated, and they had created a little tiny basement. And in that basement, they had uh, where they stored all the valuables and the jewels and the gold and all that kind of stuff in their uh, in the vaults. And when we were measuring the building, trying to get it to uh, understand how there was, everything was going to work, we couldn't get the numbers to close. The dimensions wouldn't, wouldn't close. So when we started excavating, this is the ones, the back of the one-stop shop area. This is the one-story one addition they had to it. This building had excavated underneath this building to put in their vault and their, so this was coronary number two for the structural engineers. As you can see, we're, uh, we have, by that time, we had plugged up the hole, but there was basically, 
basically a, a room underneath this building that, uh, you know, again, uh, you don't need no stick permit. You just go ahead and do it. Next please. So, demolition complete. We are, well, pretty much underway. This is what we found left from the original, from the original building. And we knew what we wanted to do from uh, postcards and, and the historic memorabilia and things like that. We knew that this is kind of what we wanted to have look like. Uh, we uncovered the arched windows. We uncovered so many beautiful things in, in there that it was just a, a real pleasure to do it. Next piece. This is the inside um, where we've taken basically everything out. We had to put in a new floor in the orchestra in order to accommodate the Americans with Disabilities Act. The original floor was too steep, and like I said, it had 921 seats in there uh, and no bathroom, so obviously it was going to be a problem. This is the original balcony structure that had to be replaced. Um, next, please. Here you can see some of the shoring and uh, rebuilding of that, uh, of that floor and of the balcony itself. Next. Here's the wall. When we um, started excavating and tearing off the inside plaster wall, we got a call from the, from the field, from the superintendent down there and said, Steve, you got to get down here. And I said, what's the matter? What's the matter? What, you know, I, another structural family or something. He said, no, you got to come down here. I can't explain. Well, when the, before the theater was built, um, this wall faced that open amphitheater that we talked about earlier. And on that wall was lettered the names of all the people from the city of Clearwater who participated or who served, excuse me, in World War I. And if you can look carefully, there's uh, Carol Dahl's name up here. There's uh, Seaver's name here. Uh, there's a whole, a whole litany of um, Clearwater family names there. Uh, Lee, the Lee family was uh, clearly represented. What we did was take uh, most of that wall down, brick by brick, and reassembled it over at the library so that uh, anytime you want to take a peek at it, uh, it's, it's been lovingly restored in a portion of it. If you go to the theater, you can still see some of it up in, up in the upper areas. Next piece. Down here, there's the same wall. Down at the lower area, uh, in smaller font and a different color, were all the African American uh, names who served in World War I. So I thought that was that was also kind of cool. Next, here's something else that we found while well, during the excavation and, and restoration and tearing everything apart. Probably not very good to smoke any any day, but uh, that tells you what it was like back then. Next, please. So here's the theater the orchestra itself without the new floor. The new balcony is getting put in. This area right here is a trench for uh, the sound people, the sound booth for performers is going to be back here. And this trench gets filled with, uh, there are two 12-inch uh, conduits in there. They run all their um, sound equipment uh, cables through there to, for the uh, uh, people on the stage. Okay. Here is the, uh, we're starting to put it together. When we tore that building down, we didn't realize that the wall, the west wall of the theater, was nothing more than a brick wall of the old, uh, the old uh, Clearwater Sunbeam. So when we tear down this building, the engineers say, "What's going to keep that wall from?" So yeah, good question. So this is temporary shoring to support that wall. Uh, during the excavation, or during the rebuilding, I should say. But next, please. Here's they're starting to load up the steel. This um, basically, in 25 words or less, the inside of that brick theater has a new steel skeleton, which holds everything together, literally everything together. Next. 
Uh, okay, here's the, we had to have two foundations, one for the temporary shoring and another one for the actual construction of the building. So talk about cost overruns and some surprises. Yeah, money pit. Next please. Here you can see, I can't, it's kind of dark, but you can start to see the skeleton inside the old fly off. And um, the, the steel beams and everything to support the uh, to support the existing brick. Next. Here you can see the start of the load boxes. Um, without the purchase of the KK Smith building, this wouldn't have happened because um, they clear or they um, Ruth Eckert Hall was in a dilemma of whether they should purchase that or not. But when I came up with the idea, if you buy both sides, then you can put in these loge boxes, and the value that they were going to generate would more than pay for the construction or the purchase of that KK Smith building next door. This is a uh, working platform that's about 12 feet off the floor. Um, that's when they were doing all the, the openings and, and uh, working all the, the structure above. Next, please. Can I ask you what a loge box is? Loge box is basically like an opera house where you see the little, um, like four, five, maybe six uh, seat kind of a balcony with a, with a railing on it that, that sticks out into the orchestra and above the seats below. Are yeah. these, uh, they are, but um, if you if you buy and they, they uh, people buy them for the season, and if they don't want to go to the show, they give it back to Ruth Eckert Hall. They Ruth Eckert Hall then will sell it to you uh, at a at a premium. But you also get to go to the dress circle and have dinner and drinks before and after the show after the performance. Next. Uh, this is the start of the main lobby. As you can see, was the, this was basically the staging area for all the construction activities and plan tables and, and everything else. This is really where the heart of construction was going on. Next, please. Uh, this is the catwalk where um, a big decision was made about the lighting for the stage. Uh, some theaters have a bar that comes down with lights on it and, and they go up and down and my concern, and it's obviously a lot less expensive to do it that way, my concern was, well, what happens if a light burns out during a performance? You, you can't lower that thing then. So what happens is we have a, a between all the trusses and everything, there is a catwalk up there that's almost impossible to get to because you have to climb over so many things. Um, and it is not ADA compliant, I guarantee. But you can see here some of the big trust members, um, fortunately, that were not termite ridden, uh, damaged badly. Next please. Here we're starting to see the, the facade take place. Okay. And here you can see the loge boxes now getting in their, their initial form. The original idea was to have them staggered so that the back ones would be a foot higher than this one, a foot higher than, and so forth, but the existing structure wouldn't let us go that high. So these two are at the same level. This one is a foot lower so that the people behind have a better view of the, of the stage. Next. There's the inside of the fly loft with all the double rigging, uh, the most expensive, but um, that's how it has to happen because you're very limited on space. Next. Um, kind of dark, but that's a, that's a look of the 24 um, lines of rigging. Next. And there you can see the beautiful um, maple flooring that it just broke my heart when they painted it. Oh. Of course, it, you know, the maple is because all the dancers, you know, are on maple, or on, uh, on maple floors. But to leave it like that would detract from all the performances so it gets painted black matte. Matte. Oh, Next. There's the 
here's the uh, beginning of the other, the front lobby. You can see the arch windows uh, and the uh, framing of the above. The slope beams, if you will, is staggered down the seating in the balcony, the upper, upper portion of the balcony. Next. Here is uh, the 12 foot wide part of the 15 foot wide at the front building. And again, one of the one of the many amenities that um, the performers like. This is a little kind of a bathroom with a shower for the road crew. So many of these performers come in on a big tractor trailer or a big uh, big um, cruise uh, motorhome, and all the stagehands have no place to do anything. We even have a laundry down underneath these stairs for the stage crews to, to be able to have some clean underwear, which is very, very appreciated. Next week. There you can see the stage. Uh, this is where we built out the existing stage right here. Here's where those major, major um, bass, bass speakers sit. <coughs> Uh, this is the dress circle starting to take shape. Uh, when you get um, a ticket for the Loge box, this is where you can have dinner. Next, please. This is uh, the back of the uh, back of the facade, getting ready to uh, one, of the, one of the highlights. I thought was, uh, was the, the installation of the sign, which is going to be next. Next, please. Oh, that's the rigging. Just a close-up of uh, the, the bridge and the how the rigging is, is all set up. It's kind of a neat deal. Next. The, this, uh, this fellow right here with his back to you is Zeb Buckman, who is the director of Ruth Eckert Hall. This is his friend from uh, Louisville, who is a um, metal sculptor. Uh, and this is the mock-up one of the panels that were going on the uh, balcony outside the walkway. This guy right here is the electrical subcontractor trying to figure out how to put lights in this thing. Next please. There, there you can see a detail of, of the thing. If you go back one, can you go back? Yeah. The whole concept of each panel is that, that looks it's supposed to look like a ticket stub? You can see the, the perforated corners or the notched corners and the perforated. So that that's where that design came from. Next week. Okay, I took the detail. This this was probably the the most exciting part of every of everything. Uh, at least it was for me is to see the this is the start of the installation of the sign, the front the blade sign on the front. Next. There it is going up. We've got the front of the building pretty much completed. Sorry? Absolutely. Uh, we closed Cleveland Street for several days. We closed uh, just this block. Uh, we closed um, Osceola in front of the um, town hall, city hall, excuse me. Um, when? Um, this was in November of 20, 2016, 2013, 2013. Keep in mind that Gallagher's last performance was in April. We had to have everything ready by mid-December. So that's, you know, take everything apart, put it all back together, and we had no idea what was underneath all the skins and the plaster and everything else. So it was a 24-7 project for us. Next week. There it is going up. It is designed like the old um, theater uh, lighting, marquee lighting, that the lights around the perimeter will actually travel, to what they call run. They'll, they'll uh, be uh, Anime. But the city of Clearwater's anti-fun sign ordinance 
does not allow for animated signs. So uh, if ever they change that or give a special exception, that's, uh, that's ready to go. Next. Here's the uh, auditorium now. I'm going to spend a about five minutes talking about the seats. The seats, uh, the contractor was pleading with the, uh, the Ruth, Ruth Edgar Hall people said, please buy the plead, buy the confirm, consider, you know, sign the contract to get these seats. <coughs> cool. Well, they were negotiating back and forth. <coughs> Finally, they agreed to, agreed upon a, a style and a color and everything else. And they said, okay, well, we can, why don't we have the seats? And they said, well, um, earliest we can get it is middle of January. And <laughs> Sam Buffett said, no, you don't understand. We have a performance December 15th uh, at the Ruth Decker Hall. We need the seats. So they started him and on and back and forth, back and forth. Come to find out that the backs of the seats are made in India. The frames and the, the seat part and the end panel are made in Italy. And we, we finally get a hold of the people making it in India. And they said, OK, put it on the, on the freighter and let's, let's get it over here, unload it over in San Francisco. No, they came around uh, and, and dropped it off to Jacksonville. And, and they said, well, that's all well and good, but we have a, a dock strike in Mumbai. So, you know, now what do you do? So I can tell them, well, get an airplane, put them, on, put them on the airplane, get them over here. By that time, they had settled a strike, and the freighter with this container that was on its way. The other parts from Italy were on a tramp steamer that was from an Israeli origin. And Seth Buffman was now, this is like Thursday before the Wednesday, okay? He's going nuts. So he calls the, uh, the seating manufacturer. He gets the name of the boat, the ship that this is on, the, the stuff is on. And he gets the ship to shore radio and he's calling the, the, the Israeli anchor, uh, freighter, and he's talking to the uh, navigator on the ship. And the navigator, I'm sure, thinking this is some kind of a terrorist plot. That this guy is talking to me about, you know, getting it to, you know, what's on the ship, or to, you know, is my container there, blah, 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 blah. So Zev huh, starts talking to the navigator in Yiddish. And so the navigator said, wow, maybe this guy's for real. So he said, okay, I'm going to talk turn you over to the captain. So he turns him over to the captain, and Sam introduces himself as, I can't remember the name of Zeverard, it's about this or something like that. And there's this long pause, and, and the captain of the ship says, sir, were you ever called that name? Um, and Sam says, well, yes, that's the name, you know, I had when I was in the army uh, in Israel. He said, sir, you are my uncle. I haven't seen you since I was nine years old. And apparently I still get my hair too. Bristles on the back of my neck right here. So anyway, he said, yep, your container's here. I see it out there, it's number whatever. And we will be in uh, New uh, Norfolk, not Newark, New Jersey, Port Friday. And this is the Friday for the Wednesday when they have a performance. So everyone's kind of, you know, a sigh of relief. So Zev calls the port of Newark and they say, oh yeah, the ship's coming in, it'll be here Friday afternoon late, um, but we, we don't work on the weekends. We're closed on the weekend. So, okay, and panic number 47. Um, Zev hires three long haul drivers and a container semi-tractor trailer. They load it up Monday morning from Newark, New Jersey. They start driving down 75. Tuesday afternoon at 3 o'clock, they're in Gainesville. Okay? 
they had made the decision that these first 10 rows of seats are portable. They're bolted down, but they can be removed for dining purposes and things like that. Um, so they were going to, the, the contractor said, okay, let's get some stack chairs like this. We'll lace them together with uh, some zip ties and we'll, uh, because we still haven't had the final certi certificate of occupancy. The fire marshal has to sign off on this because he, you know, he can't sign off until all the seats are there so they can make sure that the width, exiting widths and everything else are, are appropriate. So, um, like I said, Tuesday afternoon, uh, everything arrives. They start working through the night. Uh, and about 2 in the morning, they decide, no, we're going to tear apart the uh, banquet chairs that we had strapped together. We're going to go for the whole Megillah. So about 6 in the morning, they had 30, 35 workmen all there all night uh, putting it together. It's, they kind of snap together. and. It's not all that complicated once you get once you get started. Um, bolted everything down and, and connected each uh, each end panel is uh, has a light in it that, that you can see that uh, the electrical connection there. So all of that had to be done. And by 10 o'clock uh, in the morning, they were ready for the fire marshal. So he comes down. He walks through the entire project. Uh, he had been there before um, because you know he had said, "Well, I want an extra exit light here, and um, maybe an extra sprinkler head over there." So he was familiar with the project, but he still didn't have those seats in, so he could measure the exiting and, and everything else. Next picture. Again, another picture of the uh, the orchestra with the balcony, uh, and these panels that you see around the side are acoustical panels. Uh, these as well, um, because uh, the space itself, according to the performers, is actually very, very good acoustically. You can see the catwalk up here. This is where all that lighting bridge is. Next. And this is looking down at the, at the stage from one of the loge boxes. Uh, and the rail up here is designed so that you do not put a drink on this rail because it will fall over and drown somebody in the, in the orchestra below. You can see the loge box on the other side. Yeah, you can see them over there on the other side. Yep, see how they stagger down? Next one. Here's the front lobby. Here's our uh, the finished product. Here's our arch windows. Um, one of the main concerns was is this used to be the only way to get in and out of the theater, and the problem was going to be this elevated area uh, is about 14 inches above the street level. So trying to get a wheelchair up here was nigh impossible. Thank goodness the main lobby and entrance is down here in the old. Loki building and the ramp is at this point was uh, able to make it make it work. So this is usually most for exiting. Can, can you circle back and finish the story about the fire marshal? Because I'm still sitting here saying, when did this actually get? <laughs> you he called the building department at two o'clock. They typed out the certificate of occupancy, and at five o'clock we had the ribbon cutting. Oh. And that performance was that night by Michael McDonald formerly from the Doobie Brothers, and uh, like they say, the rest is history. Next. This is another look at the, uh, the front lobby uh, with, with the ramp. That's our ADA compliant ramp to get from the main. Okay. Next. This is the, uh, the, the main bar, the main uh, lobby bar, if you will. Um, I still like that. Next. And this is the finished product of the dress circle upstairs. So if you have, if you uh, buy the tickets for the loge box, this is what you, you know, they, they serve a very nice buffet up there. There's a little piece of wood flooring right there. 
that is from the original stage. So we'd like to, like to point that out. Uh, what else? Next, please. This is the green room, which is probably one of the largest in the performance community. Um, the speaker right here, or this that looks like a speaker or, a, or an amplifier, is actually a refrigerator that was donated by one of the uh, one of the amplifier manufacturing people. Next, there's the finished product from above. One of the items during the construction, or during the design, I should say, I would sit down with the um, the manager manager who was going to be here and we would do things like work out uh, beverage food beverage things and one meeting we were there and I said uh, okay we need to talk about security cameras where are they going to be and Jeff would say well I, I need one here to look at the box office and I need one here to look at this concession stand I need one here and they're yeah, okay that should about do it I said well Jeff what about the back of the house what about all the course rooms and you know, all that going on back there. He said, Steve, I don't want to know what's going on. <laughs> Next, please. So there's the beginning. Next. And that's the finished product. Oh. Yeah, cool. Huh? Yeah. All right, questions? Yes? Yeah, you fill in the trenches on the roof so they don't have the rain there. What do you do with the rain? That's the building. Yep, it, it goes back to the back of the building, but it's now in cast iron pipe. It's insulated. Oh, so, right. so you still use the it. It still comes, yeah, it still, the water still comes into the building, but only where we want it to. Okay. Any question? Yes. I seem to recall there was a John Baldwin shop. Yes. Yep. Originally it was John Baldwin, or, or uh, Clearwater Sun. Then it was a um, savings and loan. Then it was John Baldwin who had relocated from the corner of uh, Fort Harrison and Cleveland Street to here. And then it was vacant for a while. And, uh, excuse me, um, Pat Loki uh, moved here from her store over on the beach when she got kicked off because Pelican Walk was happening. Another truck project I did. Um, and so she took that space over. And then for a while, she took over the little Dahlia's uh, space for a while when the Chamber of Commerce uh, relocated over to this building. So a lot of skeletons buried in this block. <laughs> Man. Wasn't there a Sigmund's jeweler store, jewelry store on the side, on the Osceola yeah. side? That was this one over here that became K.K. Smith, or P.K. Yeah, Smith. Or, I think it was Sigmund's. Sigmund's was on uh, Fort, Fort Harrison. Was it? Charlie was in our school together. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Sigmund, yeah, 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 you're right. I just have a question about how come, well, I went to this theater once a little girl, we had the Mickey Mouse Club, I don't know, I'm probably older than you, we had the Mickey Mouse Club, and Terry Charles played the organ. Uh, he had a beautiful world. And so, anyway, uh, why, and I've always wondered, is there no marquee to tell us what's playing? I'm eating across the street at Tony's, and all these people, at, what, what are they going to see? We don't know what's playing. Because of the signed ordinance, oh, okay. this was a stretch. Okay. This was a stretch. These are the posters of coming attractions here, along here, and the city of Clearwater and the infinite new wisdom, along with the signed Nazis, um, <laughs> considered these all of these to be signage areas. Not, not to mention that there are no signs on the. Osceola side. So can you transfer? No, you can't. We had to do a comprehensive signed ordinance out there's nobody here to see. <laughs> oh, you are? Yeah. But they have all those signs in the windows there, don't they, about the history of Clearwater on yes, Osceola? Yes. That was the original. Um, it, for a while, it was changed to the Royalty Theater. And in deference to that, 
the owners or, or Ruth Eckert Hall wanted to keep just a bit of that. So they, in, in the logo and everything, they kept the crown for the Royal, for the Royal Theater um, era. But I think, as far as I know, it was always called the Camp. Yeah. Sir? I saw something probably two months ago for the first time on the theater, which was really interesting. There is the place where they still have in stone the original Capitol yep, Theater. Right there. Right, right there. The theater is spelled differently in that than it is for the current Capitol. Yep. It's the, it's the old the R -E. T -A -G -A -T -R -E rather than E-R. Is our R E is the current, and right. E-R was the E-R was, the, was that. Um, there's a reason for that, and I am, and I was told it by, uh, by one of the performers out there, and I can't remember now what it was. Either way is acceptable. The theater people, performers, uh, like the um, RE better. Yes, sir? How, how much does it cost to do the renovation? 5.7 million. Wow. Well, who, pay, who pay for it? Pardon? Who paid for it? The city. The city, okay. And uh, the agreement is that a certain portion of the revenue uh, would be paid back to the city by Ruth Eckert Hall uh, to pay off the debts. The first year, um, they had anticipated probably, I want to say, 200 uh, performances. The first year, they had over 300. So the, the payback, instead of being 10 years, is now projected to be maybe six, six and a half, something like that. And one, one interesting, um, talking to Bobby Ricci, who is the um, fellow who books all these acts, uh, both at Booth Eckert Hall, Mahaffey Theater, and here, he said, Steve, you can't imagine, it was like, before this happened, it was like pulling teeth to get people to come, performers to come here. And he said, after this, the word has gotten out in the performing community, and the agents are now calling him saying, my guy's going to be or my group's going to be in, in Florida in um, you know, 20, 2019. Do you have anything available? And, and they book this venue out two, two and a half years in advance. It's really a got to be a landmark on for, for the performers. And interesting enough, they say um, this is the kind of venue that they started in their performance, in their careers. Um, and they, they say it's so nice to get back to this kind of a venue rather than the 10,000 seat you know, open, open auditorium and uh, the, the big concert halls or Amelie Arena and, and things like that. He said it, it's really, really good to get back to the groups. Sir? I think you said it had 911 seats originally. 921 originally and no toilets. <laughs> How many seats and toilets now? The seats and toilets. <laughs> we have 728 seats and lots and lots of toilets. <laughs> That was one of the big things that we, um, because of that small little building to the east, um, a lot of the toilets in that, especially in the ladies' room, are a little bit substandard, even though there's a lot more of them than the, than the code requires. The code requires, uh, I forget now, but, but like 20 bathrooms or toilets, toilet stalls, and we have close to 35, I think. But those 20 are compliant. The rest of them are just a little bit smaller. So don't blame me. <laughs> the, the, the fly law. Um, go back, you know, go forward. Call the fly loft scenes are you saw the rigging they would have scenes that would be hanging on that rigging and it would be pulled up into this area above the stage so it's just like curtain after curtain, curtain after, after 24 of them yeah 24 of them and is that still used for that purpose exactly yeah so and the, right the only reason and, and one of the reasons that that alley 
was so important is because without it, performers would have to go from one side of the stage to the other, walk outside, and walk in yeah, on the other side, because there was no backstage, per se. The uh, Florida Theater over in Tampa is that way. The performers, to go to one side of the stage, have to come out in the alleyway and walk to the other side of the building. Now they can go across behind the, uh, there's an area behind this, the stage itself. Yeah. Sir? Did you add the space behind the theater? Then? Yes, yes. This, all of that, that whole 50-foot uh, yeah. alleyway is, and interestingly enough, when we said, okay, well, we'll just, we'll build, now that we got the, well, Florida Power at the time, now Duke, has two or three major, um, 12-inch conduits running from a transformer up in this area over to the transformer that serves the water view, water's edge tower. And so what we had to do, rather than relocate those for a cost of about $400,000, this area, this floor back here is basically a bridge that goes from this area over to the uh, area so that we didn't have to disturb the, the conduits, the electrical conduits underneath. Yes? So then you've got like 24 backdrops, and when a performer comes in, they just choose which backdrop they want. They, they, they can they have, have yep, they drop it down, they pull it back up, depending on the on the performance or the uh, or the act. A lot of the New York shows, when they go on the road, they'll take their own drop, what they call their own drops, with them. And they'll, they'll put them up on those uh, 24 bars of rigging, if you will. Also, some of them are equipped for lights. So they're electrified if so they had some kind of psychedelic light show. So now you know everything there is to know about the Capitol Theater. Ma'am. I understand in the original theater that they had a double wide seat so that it's a rolling window. Exactly. It's called the rolling seat. We, we can't. No, we couldn't because the, um, let's see now, if you would go back about four. less the, the little tiny ones that have, you know, 921 seats in them. Was this your first they theater have project? Have theater now. Uh, no, we do not. Yes, they do. I worked there. Oh. They, they put in recently. Oh, did they? Donald Rowley's. Oh, good. Ah, bravo. And it's a double body. Yeah, yeah, it's a double body. They take that years. Yeah. They went on Saturdays. Yeah. Sorry? I know, I know. Why do I not believe you, Angela? <laughs> there may be people that don't know who Donald Rogan is. Uh, he was, uh, he invented the, uh, it was an alligator, which was the amphibious tank. And he owned the big Century Oaks building at the corner of Druid down by the hospital. His father, I think his father built the Brooklyn Bridge. Invented the wire of Oh, oh yeah, that's right. I forgot that. Yeah, oh yeah, and well, the, the pictures of it, the cat pictures of it uh, being launched off the lead causeway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's pictures of it in the Bellier uh, Town Hall. Was he Century Oaks or was he the building next to it that got so divided? Spotswood. Spotswood. Yeah, Spotswood. I thought it was Century Oaks because oh. they really, he left it when he died, I think it left a Catholic church. Oh. No? Oh, that's a Brown State. That was Brown. Oh, Brown. Oh. Oh. I believe he was the one who kept the city of Clearwater, at least the construction uh, people, 
employed during, during the Depression. Um, and I was told, even though I never saw it, that the newel posts on the main staircase um, had the faces of all the workmen who worked on his house um, carved into the newel post. I don't know if that's true or not, but it's a great story. Yes, ma'am. Was this your first theater project? It is. And I hope so you'll ask <laughs> the next question. <laughs> do you get free tickets for life or anything? And, uh, and I, I get to do this. <laughs> but uh, uh, we were at a performance uh, a couple of weeks ago of the Steep Canyon Rangers, who is the backup band, a bluegrass band for Steve Martin. And uh, we have friends who are in, from the same town that these guys are from up in North Carolina. And uh, it was nice to know, we went backstage after the show and I got to talk to them and they said the, the acoustics in this house are, are just to die for. They said when you walk out on stage, you can feel that they call it a dead house. You know, there's no reverberation, there's no echoes, no anything like that. He said, it's just like a sound studio. So he said kudos to all the people who were involved in that. Yeah, it was a, it, it, uh, I would do it again if we had uh, more time. In 2020 hindsight, I don't think I would have done anything different or, or told the owners to do anything different because of um, the little pieces of the history that we were able to say. We could have very easily come in and gone, Shh, you know, wall to wall dirt. But I don't think, um, and we would have probably been ahead of schedule and under budget, but um, God bless them for not doing that. And there was thought early on that said, "Oh man, oh man, we could, you know, with all that we have to do, it might be easier just to start off with a clean slate." But we would have missed the wall. We would have missed the brick on the inside. Uh, if you get up and walk down some of the the hallways inside, you'll see the old brick that's cleaned up and polished. Looks really neat. So the World War I wall has been moved to the, the main wall? A, a portion of it, it if you uh, let's see, go back.